this is a talk to fill in a missing talk that was lost somewhere along the way. It probably won't be as live as the original, but it may have a little bit more worthwhile material because I have learned a lot since the original was given. This is a talk on Oedipus, the Oedipus myth, and it's primarily taken from the play by Sophocles, uh, Oedipus the King. Now, there is another rendition of this same Oedipus myth in the section called uh, Cultural Vehicles, Modern Mysticism Through Cultural Vehicles. In that myth, uh, the Oedipus story is told in three parts, and the original part, the part that we're covering in this story, is... Uh, a totally different interpretation of the same myth. Uh, myths are like that. They're very rich in material, and there are all sorts of things that can be said along the way. This talk is in a series called Myths of Triangles. They are meant to be studies of trinity and triune qualities in the world. Now, before we can actually get to the um, triune part of this myth, there are many side trips, many epicycles. And this talk has many, many such uh, epicycles, and very little will be said or will advance the uh, meaning of the Oedipus story as we're understanding it. Now, in the talk previous to this, we left Oedipus standing in front of the palace, hearing the plea of the Cadmians for delivery from combined plagues. Now, to us, this seems rather strange for the people to appeal to the king for relief from a plague or from combined plagues. It is, um, they're not asking for relief, and they're not asking for a handout of some kind or another. They're asking for the plague itself to be stopped. Now, in terms of our times, if people did appeal to President Clinton, who was president when this talk was originally given, I... Uh, it would be a political activity. It would not be a spiritual activity. And he may, uh, the president might give a directive to the National Institutes of Health, or a petition might be sold, sent to the World Health Organization, and at most there might be a program given to Congress to appropriate funds for research and inoculation against the plague. And, of course, there would be the photo op that accompanies these things, no matter who is the president. Ancient peoples had very different understandings of plagues and of their rulers. They had rulers and heroes, not leaders, or representatives, as, as we do. Rulers, even if they are rulers by acclaim, and heroes, had something in common. They both literally and actually represented the group. And they represented the group in a very intimate and even vital way. If the hero was a champion in battle, the hero represented the clan or the tribe or the locale. And if the champion fell, the people fell. None of the thinking like we have now or we think every man for himself. There was not a lot of individuation in the masses. Very few people had developed a good deal of individuality, so it was impossible for there to be every man for himself. 
Now, what we're talking about here in early Greece, when this uh, myth came into being, it was at the end of a very long era of divine kings. The institution of divine kings, according to the mystery schools, the Rosicrucian mystery school included, goes back to the times of the early Atlantean epoch. At that time, our humanity was beginning to manifest some of the symptoms of a deep and inharmonious fall into matter. We had uh, misused the creative force, and by turning it downward so much, we changed the trajectory of our evolution to go more deeply into a hardened state of matter than was intended in the first place. The inharmonies we're talking about that were beginning to be manifest are like the inharmonies that we see in the world around us now. When we see human creations relative to natural creations, our human creations stand out. They aren't an integral part of nature. So, we have created this new trajectory, and it is not harmonious to the ongoing evolutionary process. At this time in Atlantis, we were beginning to lose some of our involuntary clairvoyance. This was as we turned outward, and as we began to individuate, the energy was taken away from what normally would have been uh, a native clairvoyance to us. Now, our fall into matter was from selfishness, and it was from ignorance. We really didn't know what the consequence of what we were doing. Uh, if we had, we probably would not have done it. So the result was that uh, we had a very chaotic and egoistic kind of uh, living. There was a lot of wanton destruction, and the Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception tells us that uh, we did some pretty nasty things. And because of all of these things, because of ignorance and ignorance and blind action and very wrong action, we were beginning to experience a lot of sorrow and suffering. Now, the divine hierarchies that had directed our evolution very meticulously before the fall of humanity uh, did so with almost complete control of every facet of our life. And they could no longer do that. They had a dilemma. When we expressed our creativity, even though we did it in ignorance and we did it in blindness, we were stating divinity. Gods create, and when we take the creative force in our hands, we create. We did this in ignorance, and we did it in disobedience, but nonetheless, we were declaring uh, autonomous divinity. So the gods could no longer directly control our lives and every, uh, everything in them. So, it looks like that we were led the way animal species are led today. Various animal species have the same behavior, and they do things always within that behavior because that's what the group spirit that guides them uh, commands them to do, and the power that the group spirit has over them is complete. This is why if an animal has uh, offspring and humans take in the offspring, even if they bring the offspring back into nature, the uh, animals reject those, uh, those, that offspring because they have been taken out of the group spirit. 
Now, the divine hierarchies could still influence us, and they could do that indirectly. They do that now through astrological influences. And they have an indirect uh, influence over us as cultural spirits or religious spirits or things like that. We have evidence of this even in the Bible, uh, in that uh, King David, for example, is talking with an archangel who said he is about to bring the uh, people of Greece uh, to punish somebody else. And so there are... So they have some influence, and when something like a war hysteria comes up, people lose their individuality to a patriotic spirit, and they can be led indirectly. Now, these things, because we were so recalcitrant and because our individuality was so nascent, and we had just begun to uh, e express ourselves, we were feeble. And uh, so something more had to be done. Something that was direct and something that was worked for the collective as well as for the individual. Eventually, a uh, workable remedy was found. And now this, at this point, things are going to sound a little weird, and you can take it as a fairy tale if you like, uh, but uh, this is what seers find when they look in the memory of nature, and they look very carefully at different times in our past development. Now, about the time that we're speaking of, the part of the human life wave that was working out its human evolution with the planet Mercury and those that were working it out with the planet Venus also stumbled in their evolutionary journey. Now their stumble was not uh, disobedience and they didn't put themselves against the evolutionary work. Uh, I know of no source, either from individual experience or from reading, that can say exactly what it was for the Mercurians and the Venusians uh, to have fallen, or not fallen, but to have stumbled. And uh, so I, I really can't say exactly what that was. But they did lose pace, and they lagged behind. Now, this kind of thinking is an important thinking. If you realize that you can lag by having misapplied effort or having not applied effort at all, it stands perfectly to reason that you can catch up and you can surpass by using the appropriate uh, energy and uh, applying it in a right way. So, it was put to the Mercurians and to the Venusians that if they made a great sacrifice and um, did a great service, they could catch up. And they accepted. There were no fools, you know. If you, get a, if you make a mistake and somebody gives you a break, you take, take advantage of it. The sacrifice that they were to do which was the work they had to do, was to come to earth and help us in the fix that we had gotten ourselves into. They did, and because they were so much more advanced uh, than our humanity, uh, they were seen as divine beings. It's described in various scriptures as the time when gods walked among men. Now, they were not so advanced beyond us to be incomprehensible, but they were just far enough advanced so that they were something like uh, older siblings that we look up to more than we look up to our parents because they're closer to us.
And so it is when we are 10 and 12 year, years old, we look to our 14 or 15 year old brothers or sisters uh, as role models for us and not so much to our parents. Now, what the Mercurians and the Venusians did is they uh, instituted a lot of cultural vehicles to our benefit. They also worked directly, and they specialized according to their natures with those that were sufficiently advanced that they could work with to take over when they left. The Mercurians worked with the people that are called the children of fire, the people who do things by works more than by faith. And they're called the children of fire or the children of Cain, and uh, Max Heindel calls them the Freemasons. And so they were taught sciences and arts and the most important thing was that all of the mystery schools have their origin in the Mercurians. To this day, they are called the Mercurial Mystery Schools. Now, both of them worked where we had been making our greatest mistake. We were not discriminate in the way that we use the creative force. And so they worked with us, influencing us in our breeding practices, so to speak. Uh, they didn't participate in them the self. That's, that's what you a fool kind of people think. Uh, but what they did is that both among the children of water and among the children of fire, they produced uh, special classes. Those special classes are the classes from which the magicians were found or the initiates were found or they were the priestly castes or the castes of kings and queens. And uh, some of them uh, are still present in one way or another to this date. Like the Levites were a special class, and in India the Brahmins were that kind of class. We still hear about it in early European history, about well-born people who were fit to be rulers, and uh, whereas others were not. Now the hereditary class was a special case uh, because it produced bodies wherein the etheric body and the inner bodies were more loosely connected to the physical body, and therefore it was easier to initiate them into the mysteries than if there was a tight grip on the material world. Among the children of fires, this was the initiate class. And as it was in the children of water, it was the priestly caste and the caste of divine kings. Uh, the children of water do things by faith and they do things by authority so that divine kings or priests would be right in line with their nature. Now, this sensitivity was a two-way street. The king, as we just saw, was sensitive to the people. Oedipus is very sensitive to the people, and he was aware of their suffering. And they were attuned to him, because the people's fate lie in the hands of, uh, lay in the hand, no, lie in the hands of the king. These were people that were so much under a uh, national spirit or a racial spirit or a religious spirit that they didn't really have much individuality. Things like that happen here in the United States. Uh, in recent years, the Hmong people 
who uh, uh, came here from uh, after the Vietnam War because they were in jeopardy because they had aided uh, the American troops. When they came here, they lived together sort of in clans the way they did in Southeast Asia. But that doesn't mean they didn't have problems. And they would go into severe depressions. And when psychiatrists worked with them, psychiatry didn't work. It is because they were attuned to the family spirit and they were not attuned to a life of individuation. And all of our psychiatry is uh, based around the individual and how the individual individuates. So it, it wouldn't have worked. Now, shortly before the period of the Greeks, in Chaldea or Chaldea, astrologers would look at the first sight of a new moon. And from that, they would intuit what would happen to the king. Uh, sometimes they had prize bulls. And these bulls lived in certain pens, and the pens were uh, astrologically designated. So that if one of the bulls got up and moved to a certain area of the pen and rubbed himself, that that was had something to do with that sign of the zodiac. And these are methods that were used to get the intuition, because people used to have the clairvoyance where they could see everything, but now they had to use divinatory practices to be able to uh, have intuition. The king had power. And he had power over people, not only as a ruler, but he was a judge. Uh, because he was more advanced, and because he had the abil- some sense of an abstract, independent, objective judgment, kings were, uh, kings were judges as well as kings. In England at one time, the king used to sit in a perfectly cube-shaped room and pass judgment. We have the same thing in the Bible, where one of the chief acts of Solomon was, was to pass judgment over things, because these were people who were recognized as having those powers that normal people did not have. The king, this is so much of a fact that the king has special over power over the people so much so that he could kill, uh, he could heal certain kinds of illnesses. It is only just a very few centuries ago that there was a disease called the king's evil. It was an illness that only a king could cure. And it was proof of a king if he could cure king's illness. If he could do that, that meant that he was a true king. And the people then had faith in the crown and uh, were willing to follow under the crown. Now, as again, as clairvoyance became more and more scarce, it was important to have somebody who had the ability to judge or, if not, who had intuition and could intuit from various kinds of symbols. Uh, We find something like this in Tibet until this date. Uh, People find out who they were from past lives through processes involving symbols and intuitive divination of those symbols. So this brings us now not to king's evil, but to plagues. Now ancient people had a very different understanding of plagues. If we think of plagues in our time, uh, we think of using DDT, which we can't do anymore, or nowadays they take Roundup and spray with Roundup. In the ancient times, people appealed to the gods, or they did so through the kings. And they had to find out where they had done wrong, or where the king had done wrong, or where both had done wrong. 
And if they found out what they would had done wrong, they would atone and reestablish uh, the divine harmony, and things would go forwards. In our times, we use Roundup. And what happens is from the consequence of the Roundup, we have a higher incidence of cancer. This is because we try to solve our problems with the second sin, the sin of Cain. We try to kill anything that gets in our way. So what do we do when we have cancer? We try to kill the cancer with chemotherapy. The whole idea of balancing one's entire character and seeking spiritual healing or something like that would be laughed at by most doctors. So, what we're saying is there's nothing wrong with science and technology. There's nothing wrong with faith, even blind faith. They have their own place, and they have their own time. But it's so much better if we bring together faith that leads to, wish into it, leads to intuition and knowledge, which is like blending fire and water. And if we do that in our consciousness, we will advance much better, and our things will be more harmonious with nature. We're looking for that balance. Everything that humans seem to do these days uh, destroys a balance in nature. In fact, in this regard, we are almost opposite of the ancients. In the ancient times, uh, people had more faith. And they believed in uh, priests, or they believed in people who had wisdom. They believed in the king, and they believed in the collective. The general is start establishing general harmony. We, in our times, we live in knowledge. And our knowledge is very specific. In fact, it's too specific. We do live by cause and effect, but we study only the most minute causes and consequences, and we study them in singular isolation. And we don't try to see vertical causation, and we don't try to see general causes, and we don't even try to uh, see multiple causes working in a large-scale cause. Uh, this is kind of... Uh, the, the results of this are very unpleasant. We have become materially and psychologically individuated. And we've even done that to a dangerous extreme, such that our personal individualism is not meritorious, and that too strong of an individualism uh, destroys the fabric of the collection. Well, we do unite in elections, but uh, we're still in our individualism. We're very selfish and we're cunning and we try to play cause and consequence to our advantage but it's a very short term kind of thing we are small sighted uh, we, we we don't even we, we don't even collect together general causes let's look at cancer we know that such and such substance in so many parts per billion causes cancer and then we know another substance with so and so many parts in, a, in billions cause cancer. And so some water is tested somewhere or food is tested somewhere and they look at each of these separately and they say, no, they're at too low of a level to be carcinogens because we, it's too complicated to look at a cocktail of artificial chemicals and what the carcinogenic effect of it would be. This is the kind of small thinking that we have. Now, it would be foolish for us to go back to the ancient kind of consciousness. In fact, it isn't even possible because the evolution of consciousness is a one-way street. When you know something or when you have experienced something, you can't go back to not knowing it. 
You may forget something, but you know you can't unknow it. And especially when you have a societal memory memory, and know that uh, some things are true, you can't go back. Yeah, in theoretical physics they say you can reverse time, but theoretical physics is an abstraction. And it is does not have the reality of waking consciousness, so consciousness is basically irreversible. Nonetheless, there's no reason why we as free beings cannot set aside uh, our petty, blind, small-minded selfishness to cultivate a higher faith, a more universal kind of consciousness, and in a way blend what was best of the ancients without trying to become ancients with the best that is modern. And in that way we have a balance that is the way of the future. I think that this is what is going to happen. Eventually, people, through science, might begin to have psychic experiences. And, after all, each individual is a spark of the divine, and it should be able to recognize uh, divinity, and eventually it will find that, and there will be a reunion of science and religion, or science and mysticism, or something like that. If we sacrifice our egoism and if we work, this is something that we as humanity can do. Back to Oedipus. Oedipus was a true king. He knew the heart of his people and to some extent he knew what to do. So when they come to him with their plea, he says, I have sent my brother-in-law Creon to the oracle at Delphi to learn what we must do. In those days, brother-in-laws and brothers and, and other people in the royal family were used like vice presidents or secretaries of states. They were good errand boys. And that's, you know, to some extent we have the same attitude, only just using different people. This brings up another epicycle, another side trip, and that is the oracle at Delphi. To examine the entire subject of divination and oracles is an enormous thing. It is not only too big, it would be out of place, and it would take us too far afield. Even a thorough a study of the history and nature of the Oracle of Delphi would be too much for us. So, let's work our way into it a little way to get some understanding of it. As we have just noted, ancient people were faith-oriented people. And they were faith-oriented people who were losing their hereditary clairvoyance. In breeding, produces hereditary clairvoyance, as we find in Scots Highlanders and in Gypsies and people like that, where there are groups where there's a lot of inbreeding that happens. Now, being faith-oriented people, they needed or they wanted or they lacked knowledge and guidance. There weren't enough teachers to go around to help, and so the people applied themselves to oracles and divinations to tell them what to do until they could learn and figure out for themselves the right way to live or what to do in given circumstances. Now, some of the divination and oracles were a little bit positive, Others were so negative and they were uh, they're downright revolting with some of them. The Oracle of Delphi had some positivity mixed with psychism and some involuntary characteristics. But because it was in the hands of a divinity, 
it uh, was kept in a positive state. Now, almost all means of divination require sacrifice of some sort or another. You have to reduce the ba- the the barrier of selfishness in order to be successful. Often, if a person had a lot of pride in something, they were sometimes had to sacrifice their prized livestock. In some cases, in degenerate societies, there were even sacrifices of humans. The oracle at Delphi required a sincere entreaty. You had to be sincere. You couldn't make a frivolous plea and expect the oracle to answer you. And usually, they gave a gift to the temple. Now, Delphi is a small village in the foothills of Mount Parnassus. It is only a few miles away from the navigable bay that is called the Gulf of Corinth. It's on the west side of the Greek peninsula. It is also the most significant temple of the god Apollo. However, it wasn't always the temple of Apollo. It has a long history and it has a history with quite a few variables in it. Going back into prehistory or in mythical history, it was the oracle of Gaia, the primordial earth the Earth Mother that we talked of in previous talks. For example, when we talked about Erda in Wagner's Ring Cycle. Somewhere in history, not in that deep prehistory, Zeus had an affair with a nymph. And the nymphs were, I don't know, some kind of divine being, somewhat similar to Titans, but not of such majesty. And her name was Leto, and she bore him the twins who were Artemis and Apollo. And Leto did not want to sleep with him. And Zeus did not want to get caught by Hera. So what he did is uh, he changed both Leto and himself into quail. And quail were always known for being quite fertile and quite willing to do the procreative act. Hera became jealous and asked her great-grandmother, who also happened to be her grandmother, for the uh, use of the male member. (laughs) <laughs> I don't know how to say it any other way. And the the male member was Gaia had two serpents. And they were called Delphine and Python. Delphine meant womb. Python meant serpent. So this had fertility sides to it, but it also had much more than fertility. When she got permission, she changed, she told Python or charged him to chase Leto and to not allow her to give birth where the sun may shine. In short, she didn't want her to be born on earth at all. Python chased Leto for the seven months of her pregnancy. She was, this was a seven month pregnancy and not a nine month pregnancy. Eventually, she fled to Ortega, or Ortiga, or Ortigaya, I don't know how to pronounce it. And there, she was about to bear Artemis. And as Artemis was being born, she helped her across the 
narrow straits to a floating isle that was called Delos, an isle that became sacred to uh, Apollo also. On the north side of the mountain, Mount Delos, the sun never shines because the mountain is so steep that it's all that the north side is always under shadow. And there in the shadow of the mountain where the sun doesn't shine, uh, she bore uh, Artemis and Apollo. And uh, she bore them between two trees, a palm tree and an olive tree. I believe the olive tree was for uh, Apollo and the palm was for Artemis. She had nine days of labor. Immediately at the birth of the divine twins, the island no longer was floating and it fixed itself and stood there in the same place ever after. Apollo, shortly after his birth, took off for vengeance and he went to Delphi where the python knowing he was in trouble went to hide so he and his sister Delphine went into a hole to hide Apollo wounded python with several arrows and then entered the temple and the hole in the temple and he wrestled with python And it was quite a wrestling match because he wrestled with Python for an entire year. And uh, finally he dispatched uh, Python right in the temple, which was an act, uh, a very strong act, to desecrate the temple by killing something in it. He was making a statement. He's saying, this place is mine now. You better not uh, mess with me at all. After that, he was known as Apollo Pythias, who sees all and knows all. Gaia pleaded with Zeus, who set up the Pythian games uh, to honor Python, and he ordered Apollo to purify himself and to purify the temple, because it was a sacrilege that Apollo had done. Apollo and his sister Artemis went to be purified somewhere else. They were not purified in that temple. Later, after he had learned from a prophecy of Pan uh, what was to be done, he took over the temple. And the priestesses were still called uh, py- Pythonesses, but they were Apollos Pythonesses. The temple and the oracle remained open until the birth of Christ. And a lot of other oracles, the oracle of Orpheus, also went silent at the time of Christ. Uh, the, uh, the Orphix, for example, uh, Plutarch, the, not Plutarch who wrote the histories of lies, but Plutarch who was a Neoplatonist, gives an, uh, a reason why the oracles went dead, and his uh, reason is the same as we find in Christian mysticism. Uh, probably it had something to do with the Mideast earthquake that occurred at the uh, time of the crucifixion of Christ, but that's a little far afield from where we want to be. In fact, we're going rather slow with this, and this is going to be a little bit long. From this little fragment of the myth, we'll just touch a little bit on a few things and not go into it uh, real thoroughly. First off, This little mythical fragment is part of a cosmogenical or cosmological myth. The two serpents are the two serpents that we find on the caduceus of Mercury. And they represent the involutionary path, being the female uh, serpent, and the evolutionary path, which is the male serpent. The quail are like the different globes 
on the spiral path that the serpent makes passing through the different globes. This is a very, very, uh, very visual uh, rendition of things that we find like in the uh, cosmogenical section, part two of the Rosicrucian Cosmo Conception. The place where the sun may never shine is right here where we are on this earth. What we're talking about here is a spiritual sun. The spiritual sun no longer shines here because of the opacity of matter that we have made become so hard and so dark. The moon in this story was born or partially born before the sun. And this agrees perfectly with... uh, uh, modern Christian mystical cosmogony. In the old moon period, a kind of moon was produced before there was a sun and before there was a solar system, which did not occur until the earth period. So it's amazing the detail that we can find in these ancient myths and how it is borne out completely in uh, uh, the findings of modern uh, scientific seers. The uh, fixing of the island is the congealing of the earth itself. In Lemurian times, it was molten. And what some people think, in fact, Max Heinel even hints at that was called a continent of Lemuria would be the parts where there were hardened parts of the surface surface floating in uh, lava or magma, magma or something like that. It's also something of an initiatory myth, because initiation is based on cosmogony. Uh, there are several, several schools, seven schools, and there are nine degrees of initiation. The struggle with Python is the struggle with zodiacal principles, one for each sign of the zodiac. In the classroom where these class where these talks were offered, there is a large diagram of the sinusoidal path of the sun relative to the uh, uh, celestial equator, and it looks like a serpent. It is the serpent of uh, evolution, and it is the Pythus, Pythias uh, Python that uh, Apollo. Uh, struggles with. So in initiation, we are all the sun, we are all the hero, we are all trying to be initiated, and we get different trials, usually at the new moon, and the new moon of every sign of the zodiac, when we pass through that, we are ready then for initiation. The seer who has passed through these trials, does see all and know all, but not all at one time, of course. It is true that in the world as it is now and in this myth with with Apollo, that there's a strong tendency toward the masculine. When Gaia was the earth mother and had the oracle, the tendency was strongly toward the woman. But this is not just another partisan, masculine usurping of the place of the goddess, because uh, that's not the way it is. Many people identify too much with their gender, and when they identify with their gender, they see that uh, they have... uh, uh, not been treated fairly, you know, women like to say we have those in, I shouldn't say women, those uh, incarnated in female bodies like to say, oh, the men have taken away all of the uh, uh, things that used to be the property of women. But this misses the point. In cosmic history, as well as in human history, Things swing back and forth through, through different poles. 
Sometimes things swing to the left, sometimes things swing to the right. Sometimes things are more feminine, sometimes they are more masculine. Because we need many, many, many experiences to become uh, what we are going to become. And instead of taking a partisan stance like uh, our god or our goddess has been cheated, if we try to understand what is right now, and uh, do the best that we can with it, uh, we'll have a much more fruitful life and we'll get much more out of our existence here. Uh, things are likely to shift back to the feminine again, and in terms of culture and history, it looks very much that way. Sometimes there's a neutral point between the two, when the masculine and feminine are equal, but eventually things will swing back to the feminine, and this is an ongoing activity. The idea is is that we should transcend polarities so that we can look objectively and get the most that we can out of both polarities rather than blindly identifying with one or the other. If we look uh, very closely at this facet of the fragment of a myth, we find um, something more important. We note a shift in the orientation of consciousness, which we will look at partially in a later epicycle. And uh, we see a shift from something that is geocentric to heliocentric. In short, in the shifting from Gaia to Apollo, who is the god of the sun, we see a shift in consciousness away from earth-centered consciousness, something that is very particular and something that is very personal. Apollo, in this sense, represents an outlook that is based on the center of light and on the worlds outside of us. Now Christ, in the modern mysteries, in this sense, represents a source of internal light that doesn't shine on this earth. A light of spiritual intelligence. And that certainly doesn't need any intermediary cycles. Meaning to say that the uh, any either intermediary oracles meaning to say that uh, the oracle shut down. When we examine how the oracle functioned, we can get a little bit of insight into our work in our times. When somebody had a question and came bearing gifts and pleading and imploring the Pythonists for answers to a very urgent matter, it had to be urgent, and it had to be a real need. It had to be germane. Couldn't ask for somebody else. Now, we have mentioned gifts in the sense that self-sacrifice is a necessary act in order to be able to awaken and expand consciousness uh, beyond the cramped confines that we have now in our bodies, our little personality with all the egoism and such with that. Unless we realize to the very core of our being that God is what it's all about, the solution to our suffering of the most, you know, unless we recognize that, we can forget about enlightenment. The real and urgent thing that we're talking about in general is our need for understanding what the intent of divinity is and what we can do to help it all. We can't heal, we can't create, we can't do anything magical unless we truly pray and apply ourselves with everything we have and sustain it for a long time. We have to become new people. We just can't stay as we are now. 
Now when the Pythonists and the priests were moved by this imploring, the Pythonist was cleansed and purified. After that, she was said to have chewed on some leaves, and then she ascended into her seat. And her seat was something like a basket, and it was suspended in the midpoint of a golden tripod. And the golden tripod was over a crevice in the earth. And she remained in the basket until the vapors rose up from the cleft, from the crack in the rock, and she inhaled them, and this put her into a prophetic state, and she cried out prophecies. In previous studies of myths, we have talked about the tetrahedron the three-dimensional platonic solid that is made up of four uh, equilateral triangles. And we mentioned a long time ago that it represented immaculate conception. That is the conception of a self by the divine. It's the process of conceiving a transcendent being that is behind everything in our personality. We also also mentioned in the past that in a lot of uh, Catholic countries, in little prayer places called oratorios, there is the symbol of an eye in a triangle, which is called the all-seeing eye. So we see here again that the waking consciousness, or in this case the entranced consciousness of the oracle, is focused in the center of something that represents Trinity in three dimensions and she's in the tripod. Now the gas that comes from the earth is brings us to yet another side trip but the side trip is exceedingly long and it is beyond the allotted time. We'll look a little bit at it along the way but it's it'll be very brief and it'll be very fast. Now, in the biblical version of the fall of humanity, we were cast out of the Garden of Eden for disobedience. We ate of the fruit of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. In the past, we have... uh, looked at the Garden of Eden, and in the future there's another series of lectures on the origin of evil that goes into the Garden of Eden. We spoke of this as being a very isolating experience, because it has been the fruit that has made us increasingly material and separative in materialistic knowledge. The more we eat of it, the more famished we are, and the more lonely and irrelevant we are to greater knowledge. So let's look at the Garden of Eden for a brief little bit to get into this epicycle, and then back to the Pythonists. In esoteric language, the Garden of Eden is a shorthand for the spiritual worlds and perception of the spiritual worlds and life in the spiritual worlds, as opposed to this outer material world. Max Heindel tells us that the four rivers are the four ethers that flow into our cranial uh, ethereal consciousness. By choosing to uh, excessively direct the fluids or gases in our cerebrospinal system downward and outward into sexuality and sensualism, we have desensitized ourselves, and we have diminished the full into the Garden of Eden and we have lost the inward vision. Previously, as we noted in an earlier talk, we named 
the animals. That is, we still had creative powers yet before the fall. And under the guidance of those hierarchies that uh, guided every little bit of our lives, we helped the animal forms become animal forms. We did this by tr- throwing off the animalistic things from ourselves that they represent But also we form them learning how to become creative beings, which we are intended to be. When we were cast out, all of that changed. And we're told that we have to do things by the sweat of our brow, which means physical labor, which means brute force. And we are almost like the animals now, rather than like the becoming divinities that we were at that time. We were told to go out and to conquer the world. And we have done that. And we have done that with blindness and not too much insight. We've done it in selfishness and we've done it in sin. But we've done it. We have for a long time uh, conquered and brought the world and ourselves into some rather difficult situations. We're in dire straits, as the idiom goes. At the same time, we have accumulated quite a bit of soul power. And most people don't even know that they have the soul power because of the insensitivity that we have. In order to reap the benefit of that soul power and to become seers again, we must be humbled. Not only must we be humbled, but we must be refocused. And we must turn that creative energy propelled by soul power upward. And we have to be humbled by reaping the huge backlog of destiny that we have. This usually means Suffering. But it's purposeful suffering in order for us to glean even more soul power out of the unredeemed destiny and to be humbled at the same time. So we are preparing that suffering by following the way that we are following now. The earth has to change since... uh, Uh, Part of it has been removed. There has been an imbalance and the continents move and when the continents move there has to be cataclysms. So we have the soul power but it's not really in a ripened state. We have not cultured the the talent for clairvoyance. In order to develop that inward Ability, it, it takes enormous amounts of time and trouble for year after year after year. It's a very subtle work and it takes a good deal of culturing. Uh, I think that uh, culturing in any which way, through various forms of inner exercises or through prayer or something of that nature, we actually are culturing that. So, we're uh, redirecting our consciousness and we are experiencing in such a way that we're soon, we hope, to be able to use soul power. Something has to trigger a rapid transformation. Something, because we don't seem to learn elsewise has to shock us out of our folly, our materialistic folly, so that we can have a more inner outlook. And uh, we can see what so we can see what is behind us. Our destiny is intimately tied up with the destiny of the earth. The earth is our school, it's our lab, it's our it's our studio It's our place of work for the entire creative work. It is a very interactive place of work. 
we consolidated it as we were consolidating the ability to have concrete thought. We consolidated the vapor into the oceans. And when the earth is dissolved, we will be dissolved with it and we will be part of the dissolving. In the time of Lemuria, at the time of the fall, there were all kinds of earthquakes. And uh, because the earth was, you know, was very young and things were floating to the top and it was, you know, it was quite a, quite a, uh, quite a remarkable thing. The processes that we work on or work through are intimately connected with our soul powers or our soul process as they are connected with the process of the earth evolving. When the Pythoness ascended the tripod, she inhaled vapors and she had visions. With some great earthquakes and volcanoes, the same gases or gas-like substances are released into the atmosphere. In some corners it's said that every time that there is a volcanic eruption or an earthquake, a new clairvoyant is born. Now, we have to be very careful here. It isn't the gas or the substance that produces the clairvoyance. If you do not have the soul power and you have not cultivated clairvoyance, the gases can go past you and tell you until you are poisoned by them and you will not have visions and you will not unfold clairvoyance. Sometimes there is a external thing that in our physical body is necessary to complete the physical part of the work, but the greatest part of the work is still inward. It's a sad commentary that I even have to say this, because in our society so many people use drugs and chemicals and things like that to have very poor very uncontrolled experiences of the inner worlds, whether it's heroin or LSD or mescaline or whatever. That's that's a materialistic outlook. Only spirituality can result in true spiritual vision. And inwardly, unless we become, unless we become spiritual, we cannot unfold that. Nonetheless, we are incarnate beings and there is a material component, so that is there. Now, it's beautiful that we're part of all of this and this is all a very big thing. I can go on and give you a little bit of speculation in the times of Lemuria and early Atlantis with that rich atmosphere that was all kinds of growth the kind of growth that produced the uh, what we call fossil fuels today, the petroleum and things like that. And that has been buried under the materialism of succeeding ages. And when we take it out of the ground, we make the earth more likely to earthquakes. And the earthquakes release the gas that the soul power that we have developed by, conquer, developed by conquering the world is gets its physical trigger when we have done the soul culture. Now, this is a very, very brief and very uh, fast and shady uh, statement of something that is very, very large, but it's something to keep you off the streets if you want to ponder it. Uh, it's offered as a hint, as a hint so that any of you that are interested can follow up on the hint and do some study. Anyway, we're back in front of the palace. And just as Oedipus says, he will, he has sent 
cry unto the oracle, and as he has promised the people that he will do what needs to be done to purge uh, the plagues that are bothering uh, 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 bothering the people, he at that moment Creon comes from Delphi, and Oedipus asks what answer he brings. Creon says it's favorable, and he says that these affliction will uh, turn out well if we take the words well. It's very easy to misunderstand oracles because they are in an, <coughs> in a language that is not like our language. Or if he says, well, that's fine, but what actually was the oracle? Uh, the vagaries that you have given me make me feel uncertain. Creon says, right here in front of everyone, Oedipus says it is for them that he suffers more than he suffers for himself. This is a beautiful, beautiful statement. This is what you would expect an initiate king would say. I suffer more for the people than I suffer for myself. In order to be able to be trusted with releasing the soul power in acts of magic or healing, one must be purified. Purified of selfishness, purified of destructive attitudes, and one must be altruistic. One must love everyone. One must love everyone according to the needs. This is a beautiful, beautiful statement. Creon says quite plainly that the Thebians who are sometimes called Cadmians, must expel an old defilement that is beyond expiation. And uh, it must not, you know, it must not be feeding on them any longer. When it says beyond expiation, it's talking about right destiny. Max Heindel tells us especially in the astrology works, that there are three kinds of destiny. One kind of destiny is a pay-as-you-go destiny. You make a mistake, you get immediate recompense. This is quick learning. You make a mistake, you learn your lesson, and you go forward. But sometimes we make mistakes and there isn't time enough in life or we don't pick up on them quickly enough or we deny them and we don't have the consequence of our cause. What happens then is vicarious or service destiny, which is associated with common signs, whereas the pay-as-you-go destiny is associated with cardinal signs. And if you have common sign destiny or service destiny or vicarious destiny, you can work out what you have done in service. You can expiate through service. But the common signs are like the alibi a lot. They like to, uh, well, we can do it tomorrow. And there is that attitude of deferment. And so what happens is often, even though one has a chance to, without too great of suffering, to expiate a past destiny through service to someone else, often it isn't done. And then that produces the third kind of destiny, which is fixed sign destiny, which is right destiny, unavoidable destiny. And so what is being talked about here is uh, destiny that is beyond expiation. At this point... Oedipus asks, what defilement? How shall we rid ourselves of it? Creon answers these questions in reverse order. He answers, how shall we rid ourselves of it first? And then he answers the part about the defilement. Deductive thinking 
deductive thinking that is a consequence of intuition works backwards. Inductive thinking, you take something and you follow it forward and follow it and forward and maybe you come to an answer and maybe you don't. In uh, reverse thinking, you could call it, uh, some people call it platonic thinking because you have the intuition first and then you work back to the uh, to the cause. So in this case, Creon is using that kind of uh, thing. He's answering the, the second question first, and then he comes to the first one. And so the answer to the second one is the purging must come by either exile or death. And the first question is, what is what was the uh, defilement? And the answer to that is a murderer who brought the plague. Oedipus asks, uh, who did the oracle uh, name as the murderer? As the murdered, I'm sorry, as the victim. Who, who did destiny name was the victim? Creon answers, Laos, the king before you arrived. And Oedipus says, I've heard of him, but I never saw him. Creon says he was murdered and comments on retribution for his murder. Oedipus says, who, who were the murders? And where shall we find them after all these years? Creon again, using the uh, Platonistic kind of thought, goes in reverse order. And uh, where shall we find them after all these years? That question was the second one. And he answers that first. And he says, right here in this land, we make make inquiry and we may uh, touch on these things and find out who it was. And then, Oedip- then uh, Oedipus asks, where was he murdered? At home or abroad? And Creon says, he went on a pilgrimage, pilgrimage, and he never returned. Oedipus says, were there no witnesses? And Creon says, only one. All else were killed, and this one was so frightened, he could remember only one thing. Oedipus said, what was that? It could be key. Creon says, he reported a band of highwaymen attacked them, and being outnumbered, overwhelmed the king. Oedipus is strange that they should be so daring as to attack a king unless they were bribed. Creon says, we thought that too, but new troubles arose and we had no avenger. And Oedipus says, what could possibly prevent you from hunting down king killers? Because the obvious, because the king is such an important figure, is a divine figure. What could prevent you from hunting down uh, a king killer? The only thing that we have in our times that is like that is a cop killer. All stops are pulled in order to get someone who kills a police officer. And Creon answers the question, the Sphinx. And at this moment, Oedipus is brought right down to the moment and the consequence and his duty. Once more, he says, I must bring what is dark to light. What a beautiful way to say it. The first time he brought darkness to light was when he answered the riddle of the Sphinx. The darkness was the ignorance and unknowing. In this case, he must bring something to light that is the regicide, the person who had killed the king. The beautiful statement of bringing something from darkness to light is in perfect spirit to the mystery schools. It's a statement taken right from Freemason, or Freemasons, as taken from Egypt. Children of light, children who have been brought to light, Oedipus says, I shall do it for the city and its God. And even my sake, 
because I could be the next. Saying, and he first he thinks about doing it for the people, then he thinks about doing it for God, and then as an afterthought, he says, well, this might be good for me too, because I could be the next person, that the, the next king that they try to kill. He then asks the people to go, and he says he will avenge the king, and uh, the priest repeats Oedipus and praises him, and the prologue says, starts singing. So what it is, is we have a murder mystery. Now, Edgar Allan Poe may have written the first mystery novel, but Sophocles wrote mysteries 2,000 years before Edgar Allan Poe. It's a uh, genre, the mystery, especially a murder mystery, that uh, is... uh, very important to Greek consciousness. It is very important because the Greeks represent everything before the Greeks was much more faith-oriented, was much more uh, water-oriented, the children of water. Yes, there were mystery schools, but the society in general was much more faith-oriented. When things moved Pass from the Greek times onward, everything has been much more knowledge and works oriented. And so these plays coming at the time of the changeover from faith to knowledge uh, is very, uh, very signal what's taking place. Now, the mystery play uh, utilizes the whole idea of mystery as a means to carry you along with the action to carry you into the whole theme of it all. The uh, oracle was easy to misunderstand since we all know the myth of, of Oedipus already. We know, we can see that he's misunderstanding it already. Uh, there's a really interesting uh, one time years ago the old uh, Twilight Zone television show had a man that had his own kind of oracle and he was told that he would die at the feet of lions and he went crazy not insane but just went crazy doing everything he, he, he thought he could would do and uh, because he felt he was invulnerable he was in New York City or some place like that, and there were no lions loose in New York City, and he wasn't going to he wasn't going to die, so he could do a lot of things with impunity, and he did. And eventually, uh, I believe it was the police that got after him, and they shot him, and he rolled down steps, and he died at the feet of a stone of stone lions. And things like that are things that the oracles were misunderstood because they spoke a symbolic language. They were as close as you could come to inner world languages, which is not at all like our human outer world language. The gateway between them was symbols. But since we were so worldly in our consciousness and still are so worldly in our consciousness, we cannot see the meaning of those symbols because we're not spiritual enough. Uh, So, it is, as the Bible says, the ways of God are the ways of man, are strange to the ways of man. Socrates spent his entire life trying to understand a oracle from the oracle of Delphi about himself, and he never did solve it in earthly sense. He had only a symbolic sense of it. All right, this is as far as we go, and the action takes up in the next lecture after this, which is a live original lecture and not a retake as this one is. Thank you very much for bearing with this uh, rendition. I don't know whether you will enjoy it as much as the other or less than the other or whatever. Thank you.